It's good to have you with us. Uh, we're going to be starting in a couple of minutes. Just a few notices to give out. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to all those who've helped prepare um, for this service and the church for Christmas. Uh, decorate, preparing the crib, uh, decorating the church, people who've organised the booking system for our carol services, and those who've decorated and cleaned throughout. Thank you to the many people who've been helping, working hard, so that we can all celebrate together. Especially like to thank Tony and Sheila Pope, um, who prepared these candle holders. It's been a labour of love throughout the summer as they've been uh, preparing these so we can have carols by candlelight safely, not burn or kill anybody. <laughs> and also, thank you very much to our choirs, our soloists, our music group and our organist uh, preparing to lead our worship. Unfortunately, we're not able to sing, but we can listen to them and you've got a carol service sheet, so please follow the words from the carol service sheet. It has been very hard work with this pandemic and the restrictions. It's been a struggle to prepare this year for the festival of Christmas. But we are determined to celebrate with hope and with joyful hearts despite it all. We have a few moments silence and then we will begin. And you might like to stand for our first carol and our last.
beloved in Christ, be this Christmas tide our care and delight to hear again the message of the angels and in heart and mind to go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass and the babe lying in a manger. Therefore, let us read and mark in Holy Scripture the tale of the loving purposes of God from the first days of our disobedience unto the glorious redemption brought us by this holy child. But first, let us pray for the needs of the whole world, for peace on earth and goodwill among all his people, for unity and brotherhood and sisterhood within the church he came to build, and especially in this community of Ashburton and our surrounding region of South Dartmoor and Diocese of Exeter. And because this of all things would rejoice his heart, let us remember in his name the poor and the helpless, the cold, the hungry and the oppressed, the sick and them that mourn, the lonely and the unloved, the aged and the little children, all those who know not the Lord Jesus, or who love him not, or who by sin have grieved his heart of love. Lastly, let us remember before God all those who rejoice with us, but upon another shore and in a greater light, that multitude which no one can number, whose hope was in the word made flesh, and with whom in the Lord Jesus we are forever one. These prayers and praises let us humbly offer up to the throne of heaven in the words which Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So we remain seated for our first reading. The prophet Isaiah foretells the coming of the Saviour. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulders and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Thanks be to God.
So our second reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. St. Luke tells of the visit to Mary of the angel Gabriel. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you, you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child who will be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Thanks be to God.
details of the birth of Jesus. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and was wrapped, wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Thanks be to God. shepherds hear of the birth of Jesus. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favours. Thanks be to God.
If you've been following your service sheet, you'll notice things have been mixed around a bit this evening. Unfortunately, we've got one or two ill or people who are self-isolating because others perhaps have tested positive and one or two have been stuck in traffic on the M5. But thank you for all our performers, the way they've stepped up uh, to sing for us this evening. Now, many of you know that Mandy and I have recently become grandparents. Um, our eldest daughter, Fran, gave birth to a boy in May, and they called him Gabriel. And our son, Sam, has also just become a father. His wife, Lily, gave birth to Josiah, they're going to call him Joss, I think, six weeks ago. And this has been a bright and joyful news amid so much that's been bleak and dark. It reminds me of the time when our son Sam was born, because Mandy never got to the hospital, and I remember it like yesterday. Her waters break at six o'clock in the morning, and I hear the groans and follow the sound of the bathroom, and I find her on all fours on the floor. And the contractions are every minute. I ring the hospital, no, no, it's far too risky to drive her in. And no, sorry, there's no, there's no ambulance because there's an ambulance strike. And no, sorry, the emergency ambulance isn't available. It's gone out on another call. Please wait for the midwife to get to you. So I go back upstairs and poor Mandy's still groaning on the bathroom floor and the contractions are every 40 seconds now. So I help her back to our bedroom, sensitively, in between contractions, and by this time Fran, our 16-month-old daughter, is wide awake, bouncing up and down in her cot, calling out and not wanting to miss out on the action. So trying not to panic, I stand at the top of the stairs and I decide to brush my teeth, pondering what I should do next and then inspiration strikes. I wake up the next door neighbour, Irene, who's brown owl of the local brownie pack, and she's had three daughters of her own, Irene will know what to do. So I go and get her, and our house fills up with neighbours. Irene's daughter takes control of Fran, and her husband brews the tea in the kitchen, and I attend to Mandy's breathing, and Irene assumes the role of midwife like, you know, the scrum half. There's no painkillers, there's quite a bit of yelling, there's some anxious looks, there's many silent, heartfelt prayers, and Sam is born just as the emergency ambulance driver appears in the bedroom. And he asks, where's the midwife? And I said, you're it. An extraordinary birth in an ordinary place. Crowding around mother and son in the bedroom were neighbours, family, ambulance driver, midwife, and she arrives the moment after the ambulance driver, and we all have a cup of tea and celebrate. Now I wonder if something similar happened 2,000 years ago with a more extraordinary birth. Yesterday's government directive that people will not be allowed to travel out of Tier 4 after midnight is actually echoed in Caesar's command that there will be a census throughout the Roman Empire. But by contrast to our situation, this means people must travel at very short notice. Everyone is ordered to return to their hometown to be counted. So Joseph and Mary have to make an unwanted journey 80 miles south from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And all this while Mary is eight and a half months pregnant. Luke tells us there is no room for them in the inn when they get there. And we imagine them arriving in Bethlehem, don't we? Late at night, as night falls, weary from the hours on the road. And immediately we think of an old English pub. Heaving with people. We even invent a grumpy innkeeper to point Mary and Joseph round the back to the stable. But you know, in reality, it's actually unthinkable. In a culture where hospitality is taken so seriously, 
It's unthinkable that Joseph's family would not find room for him and Mary, especially with her just about to give birth to a child. You see, the word in actually translates as guest room. What is most likely is that there was no room in the guest room of Joseph's uncle's house because it was taken up by an, old, an elderly aunt or cousin, and therefore, um, who was also in the town for the census. So all these houses would have been rammed full of extra family members who come back to be counted. And that's why the baby is born in the main room, where the rest of the family slept on a raised shelf. If you imagine a shelf at the front here, the family would all lie out and roll in a, uh, sleep in a line, and the animals were brought in at night, because you didn't want to lose them, and they added extra heat for the house. So in came the donkey, in came the cow, and maybe even the sheep and a few chickens too. That's what it was like. So, amongst the household animals, the baby is born. Jesus had an ordinary birth, born amongst animals because all ordinary families at their time, all ordinary families had their animals in with them. Jesus is laid in a manger, a feeding trough, because it's there, right there. A bit like today, some babies are put in an open drawer of a chest if there's no cot. And I bet there was also a family celebration. But Christmas is not just a tall tale of angels and shepherds. It's the story of the emergence of hope in a world of brokenness. I suspect that some of the public voices that have clamoured for greater restrictions on Christmas festivities don't quite appreciate its full importance. To believers, it's not just a few days of merrymaking, though I'm all for that. Mind you, merrymaking will have to be put on hold, won't it, until we can all meet again. But Christmas is not cancelled. It's a celebration of hope, of good news exploding into time and place. And hope is not the same as optimism. First, it helps to reframe our daily struggles and hardships within a much bigger story in which good news is always more powerful than evil. And secondly, it's a spiritual form of bloody-minded defiance. If you like, it's Gandalf standing on a narrow ledge, staring the beast in the eye and shouting from the depths of his being, you shall not pass. That is the point of the church and our Christian faith. We fight against bleakness, despair and evil. The birth of Jesus in an ordinary home, laid in a manger, shows that we have a down-to-earth God who really cares for us, who really cares what happens in our lives. The worries we have when we have trouble with someone who we love. Our fears about test results coming from the hospital anxiety about paying our bills. God is with us. He hears us when we cry out and he has room for everyone in his heart. The question is, can we make room for him in ours? May you know his love, his peace and his strength this Christmas. Amen.
St. John unfolds the mystery of the Incarnation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony, to bear witness to the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. The true light that enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father. Thanks be to God.
If you're able, please stand to receive God's blessing. Then we'll remain standing for our final carol. The joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the obedience of Joseph and Mary, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and always. Amen. Amen.